the Cincinnati subway is a, you know, a subject of great interest for many people. Others say, subway? You had a subway here? Well, yes and no. Usually when you say Cincinnati subway, there's usually two reactions. Some people have no idea we have a subway system. And other people say, oh, wow, yeah, the subway system. I remember that. Whatever happened to it? There is a subway tunnel under the parkway. The public doesn't see it on a daily basis. In fact, a lot of people are really surprised that there really is, or there really was, a subway system intended for the city and that a remnant of it still exists today. They hear stories about it and they think that it's just a legend, an urban legend. Of, I mean, there's, what, are you serious? There's a, there's a subway in Cincinnati under the street somewhere? That, that can't be real. That can't be, that can't be because if it were true, we'd be using it. The Cincinnati subway is 2.2 miles of tunnels that was part of a 16-mile rapid transit loop. That subway tunnel has been there intact since it was abandoned technically, construction-wise, since about 1928. The Cincinnati subway is a bit of an urban legend and that everybody that kind of grows up around the city of Cincinnati hears about this rumor of the subway system. and you know, the city's long, long past glory and this attempt at becoming a big city. Growing up, like I did in Clifton, everybody talked about this mysterious tunnel. People want to see it because it's something they're not allowed to see in this city. They can't see it. It's mysterious. It's under their feet, right below their feet. But guess what? They can't see it and they can't get there. That's how I felt. I gotta go down there and see what's there. The fascination with, with getting into that underground subway, I, I just, I don't, can't understand. <laughs> All these tours that are conducted by the various groups that go down there, they're always sold out. There's always a waiting list to clamor down there. To say I've been in the subway is kind of like a badge of honor. To hear somebody as they're leaving, as they're exiting out of the darkness of the tunnel coming to above ground is, I've always wanted to see this. And that includes the 85-year-old woman walking through the subway tunnel with a cane and saying, I wanted to see this all my life. I really was not sure it really, really existed. It's a legend that is being told by many people who, after a while, start believing the whole thing is actually fake. It's located under Central Parkway in downtown Cincinnati from approximately Walnut Street to just south of Hopple Street. It was going to be part of a 16-mile loop of mass transit around the city and that loop was intended to connect with uh, what were called interurban rail lines that went to Portsmouth and uh, Lawrenceburg, Indianapolis and the like. The city is still stung by the lack of progress with the original rapid transit system and it's still a bane to city leaders today as it was 75 years ago and that people still consider it a white elephant and a sign of the city's failure to, uh, to, to really bring the project to full implementation. The Cincinnati subway could have been one of the best things that's ever happened to Cincinnati. It was a, a long story, and in one sense the subway still exists, and in many ways it never did exist. The Cincinnati subway is a combination of politics, greed, hope, innovation, and ultimately failure. The project was underway by the 1920s, but the story begins further back than that. If you go back and you study the history of Cincinnati, from the day they all got off the flatboats in 1788, Cincinnati was developed as a big city thought of after the Revolutionary War. It started as an industrial river town. It was a very rapidly growing city in the 1800s. The general shape of Cincinnati is what makes it different from other cities. The, the basin and the hills and the river, which confines Cincinnati somewhat. So they come down the river, the I-75 of the early days, 
get off the boat, and immediately their thought was to make this city as good as an East Coast city. So from that very beginning, Cincinnati was reticent to start anything new unless it had been tried and true on the East Coast. So Cincinnati as a Midwest city today is always kind of the latecomer. Cincinnati can be 20 or 30 years behind other cities, but what Cincinnati lacks is a good modern light rail system. The downtown was the core of operations. If you look at the Mill Creek Valley, that's where the industry was, that's where the people were, that's where they needed their transportation. And at the time they proposed all of this, the automobile was essentially a dream. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, people used streetcars to get around town. At the same time, people were using the interurban railroads to get from city to city. So if you wanted to travel from Cincinnati to Dayton, you would take an interurban train. Cincinnati has spread from the basin and just has ballooned outward in all directions. Think of Spring Grove Avenue. It is a wide street. Why is that? Because there was so much traffic on that street, be it horse and uh, wagons and so forth, but uh, even the very earliest kind of motor trucks. But the industry that was out along there, the, the Union Stockyard was at uh, Spring Grove and, and Hopple. Next to it was Econ's Packing Company. You had Meat Packers, H.H. H. Meyer. You, you had, what did you get from meat? Uh, lard. You render the lard at a plant. And then what do you make from lard? Soap. So you had Jergens out there. You had Ivorydale for Procter & Gamble. Everything was there. Oh, what did you do with the, the, the hides of the animals? You tanned them and made leather. They had tanneries all up through the Mill Creek Valley there. And only a block or two east you had Colerain Avenue. It was fraught with factories. That's where Powell Crosley set up his various factories all along in there. So that's where the action was. Economically, Cincinnati was booming. However, a flourishing city still has its share of problems. As business and industry moved into the area, the population grew. Traffic and congestion soon became a hassle. The city fathers uh, knew they had to do something about downtown Cincinnati traffic, basically around Fountain Square, um, up and down all the main streets north and south. And there were a lot of accidents happening with the streetcars and the horse and buggies. People needed a way to get from their homes in the suburbs down into their jobs downtown quickly without using a streetcar. The streetcar could take 45 minutes to an hour. Meanwhile, they had the canal. The Miami Erie Canal had been built to go from the Ohio River in Cincinnati up to Lake Erie in the mid-1800s. And this concept was supposed to revolutionize both travel and uh, passengers and, and moving cargo. Unfortunately, at the same time, steam railroads had been developed. So by 1900, the canal wasn't being used anymore for interstate travel. So the canal sat in Cincinnati, kind of like a cesspool. People dumped waste into it. Um, industrial waste and dead animals also floated by somebody's house and you had to look at that every day. It was kind of an open sewer. It, it, it caused problems with miasma disease and I guess people just throwing things in there. People swam in it during the summer and during the winter people skated on it. And it was actually a very popular pastime for people to do this. That had to be dealt with by the city also, so that's kind of a thing too. Well, we have to do something with this canal. Electricity had been harnessed to the extent that they could have some uh, rather uh, early versions of street cars, trolley cars. Uh, but in the east, in New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, there were already rapid transit systems uh, aborning. And since the technology existed, it seemed maybe we, we could do it here. There was a magazine in town uh, called The Graphic. And there, I call it an early Borgman cartoon in The Graphic, which showed on the top of the cartoon, it showed the canal, the Miami Erie Canal. And below that, it showed this wonderful wide street boulevard with a rapid transit system beneath it. Mayor Hunt comes on the scene in 1910 
and looks at the situation and says, we need to get rid of the canal and I want to help people move around town faster from their jobs to their homes. So he proposed the subway system to take the place of the canal. In 1910, an engineer from Chicago who was involved in their transit development prepared a report to the city on a potential subway system. And the Arnold Report was a detailed study of the traffic situation in Cincinnati. And that study recommended rapid transit for Cincinnati and suggested ways it could be done. The idea was that it was going to create a 16-mile um, loop that would pick up all the interurban trains. Five of the nine trains came in on the streetcar tracks. And because of the sizes of the track, some of those interurbans could get into Cincinnati and use the streetcar tracks. Other interurbans could not, so they would have to drop their passengers off on the edge of town. Then a passenger would have to get off the train and get onto a streetcar and then take an hour to get to his house, all while carrying his luggage and whatever else he was carrying. From 1900 to 1910, the uh, ridership on these, these trains was, was very high. In response to Mayor Hunt's desire to look into this uh, need for rapid transit, City Council assigned him to hire th uh, three people to form a rapid transit commission. The original rapid transit commission that essentially ran the construction and design of the rapid transit tunnels was an independent commission up, set apart from the City of Cincinnati and from City Council. And in 1915, the Edward and Baldwin report came out, which suggested four ways the, that rapid transit could be established in Cincinnati. Their biggest concern at first was to fill in the canal and start building a subway. The city got the rights from the state of Ohio for that portion of the canal. It did, however, save some cost for the, the development of the rapid transit tunnel system and the fact that right-of-way was already owned by the state of Ohio and did not have to be purchased. And it also minimized the amount of excavation that was required. They had so many different plans uh, that had been advanced over a period of time. I mean, the, the thing originally was supposed to make a complete circle out to, uh, from downtown. Out the Mill Creek Valley, you know where the Norwood Lateral is today? Well, that's where it was supposed to go. In the sense that it was set in the right location is, is, is certainly the case because that's where the traffic is today and, and was then. The subway would never cross traffic. You would never have to stop like you do a railroad track. It would either go over your head or under you. So it, that was the main thing. People wanted rapid transit. There was major, major work involved, engineering-wise, politically, money-wise. The commission chose Scheme 4, which cost $11 million. But they said that that's way too much, and the engineers went back to work and whittled it down to $6 million. They went through the usual surveys and studies, and finally a bond issue was uh, floated, and the public uh, accepted it and funded it. So 1916? City of Cincinnati voted for a rapid transit system to be built for $6 million. Cincinnati seemed like it was well on its way to becoming the next big city with a subway system. The citizens approved the project, and shortly after, construction began. Construction mainly took place in the canal, where they built a subway in the bed of the canal using a cut and cover method, meaning that they cut the dirt away and built the subway and covered it. The tunnels were built on the floor of the canal and the walls were built in the open and then it was filled over. And it was easy, you didn't have to do too much digging because, well, you had the canal bed. Then with their reinforced concrete, they covered it over and, and, and there you had your subway. The construction started in 1919 and progressed until approximately 1928. It was divided into, I believe, about eight or nine construction contracts. Different construction companies actually did the work. Not one construction company did all the work by themselves. It was a series of different ones. The tunnels that are there today were constructed in a series of five contracts proceeding from Central Parkway downtown and moving towards the northwest up along I-75 
to its present day location at Hopple Street. One section would be the first two or three blocks and the next section would be the next two or three blocks and they worked on these in order. They called them schemes or plans drawn up uh, for the actual route of the, of the subway. Scheme four which was supposed to go from downtown at Walnut Street go up the canal to Cumminsville, then east through Norwood and St. Bernard, then back downtown. There was a lot more subway in those portions, but they went back to work and they said, well, we don't need subway here, we don't need subway there, so they made a lot of it above ground. As they excavated, they put the forms in, hundreds and hundreds of two by four forms to build the tunnel, all to very high engineering standards specifications. And then as those forms were being built and the concrete was being poured, um, half a mile up the road, the steam shovels were digging out the base of the canal, shoring up the sides of the canal, and continuing up the parkway. They had to build forms. At the bottom of the subway, there's a cement floor. Then they bolted the stringers, which were parallel beams that were eventually uh, to hold the rail. Then, of course, you had the sides and the roof, which eventually was going to hold Central Parkway. So it had to be a very substantial configuration of this cement and knowing where your cross streets were. The two track section where they, the, the trains could travel side by side, uh, when you came to the race seat station, they widened out and the main station was in between the two tracks. And then there were additional tracks planned there to uh, allow cars to park. They actually made progress all the way up in Norwood. Uh, once you got out of downtown Cincinnati, that was where most of the underground was. There were other pieces of underground subway, uh, four of them in Norwood alone. But uh, a lot of it was actually like a railroad bed where it was, it was graded and cut. There were all these underpasses or bridges built over every, every roadway so that uh, there was never, never an intersection. So at that time, you have Central Parkway being planned to the north or to the right of the subway above ground. Then it basically goes out 75, but you're going through neighborhoods. And once you got to Bates Avenue, you, there wasn't a house inside. It was very rural, but there was a basin. So the dirt, people say, what did they do with all that dirt? Well, they had uh, temporary tracks where they would bring the dirt out from excavating it from the downtown area out through Brighton and bring it out to the places with the low-lying areas like around Bates Street and then on out to String Street. The initial engineering plans were absolutely top-notch. I call it BC. This is before computers. And these people had to use a pencil and a paper and a slide rule to draw these things out. There were six stations that were actually built. Uh, uh, underground were Race, Liberty, and Brighton, and above ground were Ludlow, Marshall, and Clifton. The uh, first station is the Race Street station, and it's under Central Parkway in Race, right where the Automobile Club is and Media Bridges, or the, the School for the Creative and Performing Arts new building. It's right under that intersection. That was to be the main station and it's configured with the platform in the center and the uh, subway coming on the north side or the south side of that center platform. At Liberty Street, that was a through station where it just had a platform on each side, very simple, and you would just go down the stairs on either side, whichever way you were going, and the same way when you got off, you just had one exit to go up to the top and then you would cross the street. The next station would be Brighton Station. That was the same type. It was a, a through, a center a station. Then you had Marshall Street. A lot of people probably will remember that because that stood there until 75 came through at Marshall, uh, just uh, a tad west of Central Parkway. Then it went out to Ludlow Avenue, where the Ludlow Avenue bridge goes over to North Side. It was on the south side of that Ludlow Street bridge and it also was a through station. The next one that was completed was Clifton Avenue. You know how Clifton Avenue goes under 75 now. There, that was the same configuration. Now that's the only stations that were completed. There were others in the plan 
but the further out you got in making your way into Norwood, then less and less got done because that was kind of getting to the end of things in the late, later 20s. Construction stopped in 1927 because the money had run out. They had everything in place except laying the rails and, and buying the cars to put on it. But that process never occurred. The money was running out. The original six million dollars was running out rapidly. The money that they had lined up was not enough to do the work. And one of the first things they did was scale back the 16 mile loop to an 11 mile partial loop. After deciding that they couldn't run the thing completely in a circle, then they just decided to run it out to Norwood or Oakley and then turn around and come back downtown again through the Mill Creek Valley. Then World War I happened, and then after World War I, all of construction prices had doubled, and they realized that they could not build the entire system for the six million dollars. Of that six million, two million went for for construction of this two miles of tunnel downtown, 400,000 of it had to pay off for damages to buildings. As they were doing their construction, there was damage to surrounding homes and surrounding hills. So as this happened, the city would have to actually buy these houses or pay for their repair. They ran into problems that cost them money they had no way of anticipating. They were dynamiting out along through uh, Mohawk and Brighton and so forth. And houses nearby were beginning to crumble. The, the foundations were cracking, porches were falling off, lawsuits abounded. As they get into the Brighton area, this became a very um, expensive section of this. If you go out there and look up to your right, past the brewery, there's a stretch in there with no houses. And in that area, they dynamited Unfortunately, there was a lot of damage done to several houses in that stretch along Brighton. When the spring rains came, that whole hillside slid down and just crushed, crushed the new concrete and also totally destroyed about eight houses. Some of them literally slid off of McMicken Avenue and down over the hill completely. They had expenses they didn't even plan on. They would dig out the canal, then it would rain, then the canal would fill back in, then they'd have to dig it all out again. There were problems going through Norwood. Since Norwood was not actually a part of Cincinnati, they had to pay Norwood money to run subway sections under their streets. So just one thing after another, it just sucked all the money dry. Basically they ran out of money by the end of the 20s and the whole, the whole system had sort of lost favor and support with the public. The stations were not finished. There was never any electrical service put into place, no mechanical service put into place, and the subway cars were ultimately never ordered and never put into production. The money ran out, but then that was only six million dollars of probably a true 13 million dollar plan. But they, when they proposed it to the citizens, uh, they knew that I guess the people in Cincinnati were tightwads and so they thought we'll start with this one step and we'll go with six million dollars and later on once we show them the cute stations that we've built and uh, we finished the subway tunnel we'll go back and get some more money but Cincinnati citizens said no we don't want to do that and that was the talk because it never did go to um, a bond issue levy or anything like that it was definitely dropped and then the question became what do we do with the existing stations that we've built? And what do we do with that subway tunnel? Well, that seemed to be the big question. At the time, the city didn't know what to do with the half-finished tunnel. Little did anyone know, this story was about to take another turn. We had a change in the government, which brought in the, uh, the new Charterite government with Murray Seasongood. Murray Seasongood comes along in 1928 and he's the one who kind of says this either has to move ahead as a rapid transit system or we're going to stop it right now. I think a big part of the problem with the subway in the late 1920s was the fact that it did belong to the previous administration. Behind the scenes of the subway project there was Boss Cox. The Ohio governor appointed 
Cox to kind of oversee the wards in Cincinnati. And the wards were more or less voting sectors. And he was in charge of how jobs were distributed to these wards. Certain construction companies got certain jobs to do certain projects, including the subway project. As the jobs were assigned, he got kickbacks for these, for these jobs that were performed. He was in charge of it all. And as time went on, his empire more or less grew. The Charterites evolved. They named Murray Seasongood as mayor in 1926. His big effort was to eliminate every remnant of the old administration. And part of that was, regrettably, the subway project. And they felt that the, while there was not explicit corruption on part of the Rapid Transit Commission, it was viewed from a political standpoint as a, an impediment to the Charterite reforms to the city of Cincinnati. The subway failed because Mayor Season Good, once he took office, looked at the entire situation and decided that the whole project did not need to continue. And at that time they said, I think we need to stop here and reevaluate what's going on. So the city did do a very intense study on where it was, would it work, you know, how much now will it cost to finish all of this. There was a Beeler report in what, 1928 or so, which offered yet another solution and, and, and method of doing uh, this, this whole project. This was a study done by a company, I believe out of New York, and they did a very intense study on it, and that was their finding too, was yes, it was viable. The report was handed to the citizens of Cincinnati, and when they finished, they decided it was gonna cost $13 million to finish that rapid transit loop at that time, and then that was at 1928. It seems like in each report, they go on to say, well, yes, it would be viable, but it always got to the money part of it. Would the taxpayers, you know, be willing to spend this much more? The depression hitting and, and Beeler's plan not being acted upon right away, that really, really puts the brakes on the project. Over the coming decades, people who weren't necessarily involved in city politics did see that Cincinnati was growing to an extent that a rapid transit project would actually be beneficial. So these different groups throughout the decades, including businessmen's associations, the Engineers Club, saw the subway sitting underneath the street not being used and saying, we can use this, and here are ways that we could. Different organizations tried, and they weren't successful for various reasons, like the Great Depression first, and then World War II. So during the war, people still wanted to talk about the subway, but now everything was focused on the war. Then after the war was over, it was, what are we doing after the war? And what does Cincinnati look like now in 1948 versus 1929? Now you're talking about a project that is 30 years removed from when it was first, when it was, uh, first started and then abandoned. Uh, so there wasn't this generational uh, attachment to it. Um, if you look at uh, large cities like New York, Chicago, where there's a generational attachment to transit, uh, to trains, uh, it's something that people do. It's part of their life. Here you didn't have it in Cincinnati, and then you skip 30 years, so you lose it. Cars were becoming very important to the citizens of any major city. It was the way to get in the city, out of the city. Again, you get further removed, you're now into the 60s, the 70s. Uh, certainly gasoline is cheap, you know, 19 cents a gallon. Um, you know, so, you know, the, the emphasis on mass transit, where there wasn't this identification with it, where it was part of your lifestyle, people weren't going to go back to it. As the years went by, they saw less of a need to actually continue this rapid transit project, although a lot of people in every decade wanted to do it, but it just never happened. You have people who believe that it is the second coming, and you have people who believe it's nothing more than a huge boondoggle. The interesting point, of course, is always where's the middle? Uh, where is the, the rational argument for and also against these systems? People had this concept that they must have goofed somewhere, and they didn't goof. It's just that they needed more money. The original bonds that were uh, voted for by the citizens of Cincinnati in 1916 
preceded World War I, which caused a lot of inflationary pressure, and the cost for the construction nearly doubled in the time from it was originally approved by the voters to the time it went to construction. I think Cincinnati would have would be nothing like it is today had the rapid transit system actually been finished. I think it would have been a better city, a stronger city, a bigger city. People uh, began to get automobiles, uh, jobs began to move in different places. Companies were beginning to fade out a little bit. If you go out today now, of course we're talking 50, 60 years later, uh, Spring Grove Avenue is a, a mere shell of, of what it had been in terms of industry. So things change and uh, we don't know if the subway would have kept that operation functional out there in the Mill Creek Valley. If the subway project had actually been finished at the time in the 1920s, according to the way they originally conceived it, I believe it would have helped Cincinnati grow tremendously because they would have had the loop in place, they would have been able to move people quickly from downtown to the suburbs, and from that point, I believe that over the coming decades, the whole system would have grown outwardly. The city seemed to have reached a standstill without any major form of rapid transit. While the citizens tried to forget the whole fiasco, Cincinnati was still responsible for the debts of the project. When the subway was originally voted on, taxpayers had borrowed money against the city to pay for construction. Interest accrued on the initial $6 million investment. In 1966, the subway was finally paid off at a cost of $13 million. In the decades since the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, other ideas have been proposed for the subway. Suggested uses have included a potential mushroom farm, a wine cellar. From an aeronautic uh, wind tunnel to a underground shopping mall. In the 1974, Nick Clooney of Nick Clooney Productions wanted to create an underground shopping district similar to what we see in underground Atlanta. And he had it all figured out. Shops, retail outlets, but it all comes down to insurance and building codes. The problem is this. The subway was designed and built during the 1920s. Building codes have changed drastically since then. You have to add running water, you have to add electricity, you have to add toilets, you have to make it accessible for the handicapped. Nobody has been able to come up with the money to convince City Hall to let that happen. Liberty Street Passenger Station was converted to a civil defense shelter in 1960. The fallout shelter was actually built but never, never used. For a while it was in the emergency planning as a place where city leaders could go and live underground until, say, a nuclear uh, uh, radiation scare would dissipate. Essentially that consisted of a few bedrooms, a few meeting spaces, some storage spaces. There were showers constructed, bathrooms, a room with cots for sleeping, there were all kinds of cans to store water and supplies. Today the subway is being mainly used to hold the water main, some high-speed data lines, and to support Central Parkway. The tunnels are a bit of a liability to the city of Cincinnati and the, the fact that they have to be maintained in order to maintain their structural integrity to carry Central Parkway. The subway is maintained by, by the uh, structures section of Department of Transportation Engineering. Every 10 or 15 years we typically have to do some work to, to keep it in decent shape. Uh, it, is, it has fallen to our department, the Department of Transportation and Engineering, to initiate repairs when, when needed. As far as infrastructure assets, we've tried to evaluate what the best course of action is. In some cases, we've considered filling it in and eliminating it. It hasn't been used since the 1920s, but it's still there. And part of the reason is it's expensive to remove it. Um, so far, we've found it cheaper to patch it every now and then than to dig up a two-mile stretch of Central Parkway and, and, and eliminate it. As time passed, renewed interest in the subway came and went. The tunnels continued to sit idle until the city found a use for them. Currently, 
in the subway there is nothing but a water main that was installed in 1956 to augment the western side of Cincinnati. One of the reasons that the city doesn't want to currently do anything with the subway is the danger of the water main. What are they going to do if they have to fill in the subway? What are they going to do with and for that 52 inch water main? The existing water line would have to be removed if any rail transit was ever implemented in the tunnel. As part of a recent study, the city has examined uh, alternatives for relocating that water main. Should the city want to use the subway tunnel for other purposes, then it would be the waterworks expense to remove the water line from, from the subway tunnel. Could the subway tunnel really be used today? And we state that, to our knowledge, yes, it could be for $150 million. Subsequent to the construction, there was additional studies that were carried on in the mid-1920s and the 1930s, looking at justifying the need for constructing a rapid transit system. Every decade, they have to do traffic surveys, find out how many cars are on the road and how the city is dealing with it. So in almost all of these surveys, someone at some point says, we could help alleviate these problems with maybe completing the rapid transit system. And it seems like every survey comes out the same, even from the 1920s. Yes, it would be wonderful to have, but nothing ever happens. I think that in Cincinnati we have a tough time making decisions on now that we've got this report, somebody do something about this. And you wonder where those reports go and whose desk. I picture this great tunnel just like in Raiders of the Lost Ark with boxes and boxes of reports that nobody even knows that have been done. To me, that's where all the surveys have gotten to. Yes, oh, that would be great. And then I guess they put it in the drawer until somebody gets this wonderful idea. Hey, maybe we should have a survey to see if, if we could use the subway system. So it's, I don't mean to make light of it, but it just is a catch-22 every time. It goes around and around. So I don't know, maybe we need to take a survey on the surveys. Nobody has implemented these studies. Nobody has taken them to the next step. Once the survey is done or the report is finished, the word needs to get out to the public in a more direct way. There have been various attempts over the past couple of decades to develop a regional rail transit service. But every time it's proposed, nothing ever happens. Just for one reason or another, it never gets political backing or nobody wants to look for the money it'll take to actually complete the job. Survey after survey, it seemed like the subway project would never get revived. In 2002, a new type of rapid transit was proposed, an above-ground rail line to connect opposite ends of the county. It looked as if citizens were finally on board with mass transit. The initial plan for rail transit in Cincinnati was a corridor from the airport to Kings Island, which was not funded due to a decline of the Hamilton County voters in 2002. The ballot issue, as I recall, uh, was a half cent sales tax proposal to fund uh, light rail construction. I was uh, uh, surprised very much by the uh, fact that only 32 percent of the electorate thought that a light rail system would be a good idea. The 2002 vote on uh, rapid transit was on the heels of voting for stadiums and there, uh, there's a belief that because the stadiums uh, passed that this vote came too closely on the heels of it and people didn't want to have another tax increase and that's why they rejected it. So are we going to pay for the stadiums or are we going to pay for light rail rapid transit? Cincinnati has always been a, a solid sports city. People in Cincinnati would rather spend the money on sports than they would on transportation. It's easier to look at what's in front of you. A big stadium, it becomes part of our skyline. And you can see it, you can visualize it. It's hard to visualize uh, this 16-mile rapid transit loop going around the city of Cincinnati. It's hard to visualize sitting on a train traveling 
at 40, 45 miles an hour on this rapid transit system? Or do you want to visualize yourself sitting at the Bengal Stadium or the Red Stadium? Cincinnatians love sports. They love the Bengals, they love the Reds, but light rail, that's just not as important as going to see a ball game. If you want to go see a game, you're going to go and get there however you're going to get there. If you have to pay $25 to park in a parking lot, well, you're going to do that. There's a lot of Bengal fans, I guess, and less subway fans. But maybe if we had a subway, they'd take the subway down to the stadium. Did we really need a red stadium? Do we really need a Bengal stadium? Or do we really need a rapid transit system? How many of our citizens get on I-75 or I-71 every afternoon and what could probably take them on a rapid transit system 20 minutes to get home and they're sitting there for an hour, if there's an accident, it's an hour and a half to get home. The private sector never really grasped why this was important for the region, how it would benefit their business, how it would benefit their family. I think in a way, um, it's important to look at that campaign as a failure, not as a success that would have happened other than a vote on the stadiums. It was almost, uh, in my mind, an arrogant campaign. Uh, we need this, and if you don't agree with us, you're wrong. Um, and that's why it got defeated in my mind. It never really addressed bread and butter issues that people need to know and have answers about when they're talking about paying more taxes. We are responsible for our own city, and that means that we need to understand mass transit. Whether or not you're for or against it, don't just say, I would never use it, or it won't work. Eighty years had passed, and Cincinnati was still without mass transit. With every generation, interest just seemed to fade away. Anybody who takes a look at how these systems have been built in non-traditional areas, you know, when you get away from New York and Chicago and places where there's this attachment to, uh, to train travel, uh, if you look at these cities, they didn't succeed the first time or the second time. A lot of times it was the fourth and fifth ballot. The lack of a subway system, including a whole entire rapid transit system, has resulted in jammed streets, all one-way streets, parking garages and parking lots, all of which fill up very quickly and make it inconvenient for people to get downtown. Maybe more people would have stayed downtown working if it was convenient to just walk from your house to say a train line or a subway stop, you know, and just pop on there and not have to worry about a car. Cincinnati is really an auto-centric city in that there really are not very many alternatives to driving your own personal vehicle in the city. Trying to navigate the downtown streets and try to figure out where you go can get very confusing to those who are not used to it. I think we have a very beautiful, viable downtown and I would like to see a more user-friendly mass transit to downtown. I would have to say it would be a win-win for Cincinnati. There would be some benefit to alternatives to automobile transportation. One thing that does allow is for reduced congestion on the city streets. It provides an alternative to owning a car if the, you choose to do so. And it also provides um, a more compact land use, which less demand for surface parking, which is a major component of the downtown land use today. A subway would benefit downtown because a lot of people who would not otherwise have gone downtown for anything would now have a better way to get downtown. Every community of size, such as Cincinnati, is going to have a reason to have rapid transit. Unfortunately, the rapid transit here, or subway, has kind of a negative connotation, like, oh, oh, don't bring that up again, you know, or that'll never get done. It's kind of gotten into a negative tone because of getting kicked around so bad. Cincinnati never keeps up the momentum with uh, proposing rapid transit because, probably mostly because of money issues. I think, however, what's changed is the price of fuel. Uh, we also, uh, gas go from $1.50 to $4 a gallon, and people had to find alternatives. 
I think it's changing people's view of getting out of the car and taking mass transit and whether or not they want to spend their tax dollars on mass transit. The subway would just make it easy for so many people to travel and crisscross Cincinnati in a much timely manner, considering how slowly moving the, the interstates are. I-71 and 75 congestion during rush hours especially can be horrible. When there's a wreck, that ties up traffic in both directions. If it's southbound, people have to stop going northbound and check it out. That's almost a daily occurrence. It would be so much faster and easier to take an express train that would be able to bypass all of that stuff and get you to where you need to go in 15 minutes or so. I believe that would eliminate a tremendous amount of congestion. I feel as though once it could be built, would be built, finished, we would all use it because finally we would be accustomed to it. What we need to do is need to sit back and say, if we build this, where will the route be that will benefit the most people and will have the most economic impact? We also need to think not only of our grandchildren, but our great-grandchildren. How do we want them to live? Due to unsuccessful attempts at bringing rapid transit to the city, transportation problems continued to increase. Citizens have faced ongoing hardships by the limitations of failed transit proposals, leaving the future of the Cincinnati subway uncertain. Unless someone can come in with a big bucket full of money to purchase the subway and turn it into something like a tourist attraction, then this feature of the subway is that it will never actually be used for anything but to hold up Central Parkway. There's always going to be that interest in essentially salvaging the original project to make, to make it pay someday and to allow it to, to house rapid transit. I don't know if they'd have enough orange cones. You know, I think we would run out of orange cones before, <laughs> before it was done. If there's a good use that is found for it, we'd be open to suggestions. Whether or not the rapid transit tunnels are used as part of a future rail transit system remains to be seen. It's a 90-year-old concrete structure. There's some concrete deterioration. We have some expansion joints that leak. I think that there's going to be an ongoing look at using the rapid transit tunnels for something other than housing the water main that's there today. One of the alternatives looked at was to actively bring it up to, up to current conditions and, and use it as a mass transit connection. The conclusions of that study recommended improvements to I-75 and future rail transit in, that, in the I-75 corridor that could encompass the existing city subway tube. That's still a possibility. It hasn't been ruled out. If the community or the region decides to go forward with a mass transit system, it would certainly be looked at as an option. Cincinnati needs rapid transit that's smart. You need a rapid transit system for a lot of reasons, to remove congestion, uh, to reduce emissions. But the one thing that sustains it is that it has to lead to economic development. And so I think the way you, where you put the route is where you would have the biggest bang for the buck. The subway would need to go farther than one road. Right now the subway as it stands is underneath Central Parkway. For it to be beneficial to Cincinnati, the subway would have to be increased down to where it or, uh, was originally proposed that it was going to run. It has to be part of a giant loop or the subway tunnel is never going to be used. Rapid transit should include northern Kentucky and Indiana because of its relative closeness to Cincinnati. This region is growing. That's one of the great things about it. It's growing as far as its population, its jobs. What rapid transit could do is it could bring a rebirth to um, not only the core city but also the core county. But more importantly, rapid transit shouldn't be looked at something that would benefit downtown. It should be looked at something that benefits the region. We may be in three states, we may have eight different counties in our region, but we are one region. The citizens really need to learn about that themselves. Would they use the rapid transit system if we had one today? 
Would they use a light rail system? Could you get to work? Could you get to home? Could you visit your friends with this? That's going to put the subway tunnel back into use potentially. So if you want to have a rapid transit system that really is logical, that really has big payback, develop one that affects the entire region. If the subway, the rapid transit, had been put into operation and it still existed today, how different would Cincinnati be? If they had finished this system, we would see a more uh, evenly dispersed population throughout downtown Cincinnati and its suburbs. We may have actually held on to our, some of our businesses that have left the Mill Creek Valley. Our Cincinnati downtown would have been a viable institution. We could have gone to Music Hall in a couple minutes. We could have visited the Aeronoff just a few blocks off of this rapid transit system. We have to put money where our mouths are, where our wishes are for the future, and that's going to take some sacrifice. Funds have to come from the federal government. Uh, obviously, there is a local share that has to be put in, but a vast majority of the funds have to come from the federal government. And most importantly, now that we're in a time of federal stimulus, a time when projects like rapid transit are gaining great political favor, uh, we're looking even more to the federal government for that money, and uh, that money should be available. It would take a long time to line up the money. Before you line up the money, you have to get consensus. It would take a long time to get just the citizens to buy into the concept of the rapid transit system. Well, I think if we started today and had a firm commitment out of the federal government, I think that you could have uh, some of this rapid transit up and running in two years. I don't think there's any question. Right now, it's, it's the issue of money. Um, and if you can get the money out of the feds, then you're going to go ahead. When the next bond levy would come up for a rapid transit system, let's just say in 10 years, are we going to be ready for that? Are we willing to take money and put money on the table to really save our lifestyle in the future. Not ours alone, but our great-grandchildren and on. Rapid Transit is an opportunity for us to take care of a variety of problems. Everything from economic competitiveness, to reducing congestion, to improving the air. Does the city deserve this? Yes. Does the city uh, need one? Absolutely. The groundswell has to come from neighborhoods. Politicians can only do so much, or only will do so much, but community activists sometimes are the ones who can actually get something done. Whether or not you're the head CEO of a major corporation in Cincinnati, or you're living in Over the Rhine in Section 8 housing, you have the right and the responsibility to discuss what is going to happen in the future. Do we fight that fight now? Do we get organized now? Or do we just keep putting it off? You learn your history, but you move forward. And maybe as a society, we've never been able to put into action something greater than ourselves. And this is our big chance to do that. What we have learned from the story of the Cincinnati subway is that even if what you're doing right now isn't necessarily needed, you must consider the future. Because when the subway was being built, the city didn't necessarily need it then. But generations later, the city definitely needs it. The subway was a great idea, rapid transit. If you pardon the expression, they were on the right track. But so many factors, the complexities of the politics, the economy, wars, uh, progress in automotive transportation, we didn't know it at the time, but it was pretty much doomed from the start. Some days when we're down there giving a tour, I often wish that there was a switch on the wall that I could literally turn it on and within minutes the lights would come on and the people would come through the turnstiles with their tickets 
and get on these beautifully designed four car long trains that would rush the people out to their homes or out to businesses uh, on this beautiful 16 mile rapid transit loop. Remnants of the old subway system can still be seen around town, such as at the corner of this intersection, in a pile at this train yard, or behind the mounds of this ball field. No tracks were laid, no cars were ordered, and construction never made it past Norwood. A 16-mile dream became a forgotten fragment of unused tunnel. And even if they were to fill in that tunnel, people are still going to talk about, did you know that Cincinnati had a subway tunnel? And yes, it's still there.